Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, May 23rd, we are studying Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. In today's text, opposition to the rebuilding of the temple arises in Judah, leading to delays in finishing construction of the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Andrew Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharper Iron. It's good to be back. Let's talk some context, Pastor Preuss. What should we know, especially historically, as we prepare to look at Ezra chapter 4 today? Yeah, we got to know, well, where do we begin? Uh, we, we really got to begin probably with the year, around the year 722. Um, and so the kingdom of Israel had been divided after Solomon's reign. Uh, and it was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was, uh, was then, they, they, they were notoriously much more, I, uh, much more into idol worship than the southern kingdom of Judah. Although the southern kingdom of Judah certainly was into idol worship. And, and so the big thing in northern Israel, which is just known as Israel, and then the southern kingdom is just known as Judah. Sometimes the northern kingdom is, is spoken of as Samaria, because that's the region that it's in, or Ephraim, which is the main tribe uh, that uh, Jeroboam came out of. And, but at any rate, the, the, the big sin that happened in northern Israel was Jeroboam set up two temples uh, to compete with the temple of God and actually had golden calves for the people to worship uh, as the Lord God. Uh, and so it was a stench in the nostril of God. It became known as the sin by which Jeroboam made Israel to sin, and it just continued to plague them. And so in, in, in 722, God finally sent the great empire of the Assyrians to destroy northern Israel. And that, th that part of the history is very important for today's text in Ezra chapter 4, because it's like you have the great Assyrian captivity of northern Israel now sort of colliding with the Babylonian captivity with Judah. So in the year well, around 600, 603, I think, uh, you had the, the King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem because Judah and Jerusalem were also worshiping idols in the high places. And so God's uh, vengeance finally came for them as well. And, uh, and so then he laid siege for, what, five years and then finally destroyed the temple. Or maybe, no, it was, it was like 13 years or something. There were years. There were a number of times where Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem and, and Judah. The The final one was in 587 B.C. or 586 B.C. was the final yeah. destruction. But but going back to like 605, that's when Daniel and the three young men were first taken Perfect. captive. And so there was and, a and, number of times where yeah. he came. And and Ezekiel. Um, right. Was around, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so finally the temple's destroyed in like 386 or... 87 Five, BC. 586. Oh, sorry, 687 yeah, BC. Okay. Sharp, hey, you're sharpening me. This sharp, sharper iron. All right. Uh, <laughs> we got to keep each other accountable. And and so <laughs> Jeremiah says, as well as Isaiah, uh, that it's going to be 70 years. And so the captivity really begins with the first siege, where, like you said, Daniel and the young men are, are taken captive. And so finally, uh, so Isaiah actually prophesies about this, but Isaiah is speaking around 720 BC, which is, which is at the time when Northern Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. And, and so Isaiah prophesies in, in, I believe it's chapters 44 and 45, uh, that uh, King Cyrus yep. of Persia 
would send the remnant of God's people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, um, which is really an incredible prophecy. And the higher critics uh, refuse to believe that this was actually written by Isaiah. So they come up with this idea of a Deutero Isaiah and all that nonsense, which is really just another way of saying they don't believe in God. Um, and, and, but no, I, Isaiah prophesied that, that the Persian king Cyrus, who became known as Cyrus the Great, would free the people of, or a remnant, he would, he would send a remnant back to Jerusalem to rebuild. And so that's where Ezra begins. Ezra begins with the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah, where Cyrus, who had just taken over Babylon, Babylon crumbled, uh, under, uh, you know, a couple different kings, but the last one we hear of is Belshazzar, uh, who's recorded in Daniel. And, and there's a wonderful Johnny Cash song about all that. You know, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Um, look it up. Um, and uh, so Cyrus, he shows up and he, he receives a commission from God to send the people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Uh, Josephus apparently says... Uh, that, says that Cyrus would have gotten a hold of the scroll, one of the scrolls of Isaiah, and seen the prophecy about himself. Um, so that's possible too. Uh, so now they show up and they're they they they're sent to uh, this this remnant is sent back to Jerusalem, and they start rebuilding the temple and they lay the foundation of the temple. So this is the this is around the year five thirty. Okay, so there, and so there are still people who remember the temple before it was burned down, and they see the foundation, and the, then there are the young people who don't remember the old temple, and they see the foundation. People are rejoicing because the temple is fine because it's not as big <laughs> as the previous temple. Uh, and, uh, and so you can't really distinguish between the crying and the rejoicing. So there's mixed emotions there. And then what we get here now in uh, Ezra 4 is, uh, is, is the world and I would say the devil attacking. So in Ezra, in Ezra chapter uh, 3, you, you, what you have a little taste of is a kind of taste of the sinful flesh starting to attack because you have those who are weeping um over uh they can't rejoice um and uh and 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 the 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 lack of joy is is it that's another that's another theme that we could talk about but we probably won't get into that but that they're 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 not seeing this as a worship of their god um uh and and or there there's at least an evidence of that but we have in here in chapter four when the world starts attacking and the devil thereby is attacking as well, that there is a great, uh, that exercises faith in our worship of God. And, uh, and what we find here is a wonderful example for, for all of us uh, to this day on how, to, how we are to see our public confession and our worship of the one true God, uh, especially in the face of hostility. So with that historical background in mind, let's take a look at the text, and I think we're going to come back to some of that history as well as we see who the players in this chapter are. So we've got Ezra chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esaradan, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithridath and Tabil 
and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the men of Erech, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Aznapar deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. This is the copy of the letter that they sent. To Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king, in order that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. You will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from of old. That was why this city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum the commander and Shimshai the scribe, and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting. And now the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read before me. And I make I made a decree, and search has been made, and it has been found that this city from of old has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it. And mighty kings have been over Jerusalem, who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? Then, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. That is the text for today, Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. All right, Pastor Preuss, as we begin to consider Ezra chapter 4, I think it's good to come back to some of that history that you mentioned. You said we needed to go back all the way to 722 B.C. to the destruction of the northern kingdom, Israel, under the nation Assyria. As we meet in this chapter, who are called the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin— and then later they are called, let's see, the peoples of the lands. There it is in verse 4, the people of the land. Uh, talk to us about who these people are. Take us back to 722 B.C. to find out who these people of the land are here in the 530s B.C. Yeah, so these people are later known as the Samaritans. Uh, and we, we hear a lot about Samaritans in the New Testament. And so th this really goes back to... Second Kings chapter 17, you have in the days of Hosea, the, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, Shalmaneser V, who is the son of tiglath the III, who is the king of Assyria, invaded northern Israel. And, uh, and so this was, this was the year that Sargon, this is also the same year that Sargon II. Okay, so you got Shalmaneser V, who's the son of tiglath the III, Tiglath Pileser the third, by the way, his name is Pull. That's his nickname, Pull, P U L, if I if I remember correctly. Um, for some reason, my kids would always laugh at that whenever I would say Pull, and they just laugh. And anyway, uh, so but Sargon the second claimed to be the son of Tiglath Pileser the third, and he staged a coup against Shalmaneser. So you have a lot of changes in political rule going on here in this very powerful kingdom of Assyria. Uh, at this time. And so, so Sargon probably continued the conquest of Israel, and uh, he probably would have been the one who was carrying people captive to foreign lands. And, and so I'm sure Shalmaneser was doing that too. But so 
these foreign lands where it's what's one one of them is mentioned as Hala, which is uh, on the Tigris River, and that's just really just south uh, east of Nineveh, which is the capital city of uh, of, of of Assyria. But then they, they they were brought even as far as the cities of the Medes, which is just north of Persia. So that would be northern uh, northern Iran for today, just south of the Caspian Sea. So then he replaced many of the Israelites with people from these other foreign lands. And so they mention this even here in their letter, you know, that they were taken from like their like Elamites and so on and so forth. Right. And so, so the, and this was this was a strategy. It's sort of like a multiculturalism. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a foreign policy, and it's, and it's it's actually a very clever strategy that the Assyrians used and the Babylonians used it as well to carry the people away, displace them, so then they're in a strange land, so they lo hopefully lose their culture. Um, but then you also then the people who are left in that land, you flood them with other cultures. So that they lose their culture, and and so uh, uh, and so this was this was of course God's judgment on Israel for their worship of idols. But then chapter seventeen of Second Kings tells us that the new people in the land were not worshiping the Lord, right? Because they didn't know the Lord, and so God sent lions to kill them as a punishment. And as a response to this, the king of Assyria sent a priest. To Israel to teach them how to worship the Lord. Now it doesn't tell us exactly when this happened. You know how much longer after this did this happen? It's possible that this was the king who sent the priest to teach them who the Lord is. Uh, what would have been uh, Esharadon, the king of Assyria. Now they mention him there. They say we've been worshiping the Lord since you know uh, the king Esharadon. So it could be King Asharadon who would have been, he would have been the king like 40 years later, right? Mm -hmm. So his, his years are uh, 681 to 669. So keep in mind, this happened, the invasion happened in 722 BC. Mm -hmm. So now it could also happen that, that it was a previous king who started, who, who, who uh, brought the priests to them to teach them who the Lord is. And then these people, these specific people in Ezra 4, who are saying that we've been worshiping the Lord ever since Esharadon, uh, that these would have been maybe people that he brought in, right? So it appears that this process of bringing in foreign people to the land of Canaan to kind of overwhelm the culture of the Israelites was a continual thing that they did, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they probably also then continually made sure that they knew who the Lord was so that they didn't get eaten by lions, right? <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, um, Esharadon's successor is uh, Asher Bonapal, and uh, he would have continued the deporting and importing of people because he's mentioned later on um, in, in Ezra 4, verse 10. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, that's... Uh, that's that's just another little detail, um, but here in in Ezra four, which is around five thirty BC, right? This is the very beginning of building the temple. The people of the land say that they've been worshiping the Lord, right? Ever since, like I said, ever since Esheradon, and so what they are saying is true, right? They have been worshiping the Lord, and yet uh, God. And, 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 and God certainly stopped sending the lions to kill them because of that. But if you go back to 2 Kings 17, it also tells us that while the people were worshiping the Lord and were able to kind of stay off the lion attacks, they were also worshiping their false gods and they were making shrines to their idols, right? So what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with people who know the true God, but they're mixing in... To their worship of the true God, uh, uh, false worship of false gods, right? Right. And yeah. like I said, this these are who the Samaritans are, and this actually helps you. This episode really helps you understand why there's so much animosity between the Samaritans and uh, the people of Judah uh, by the time of Jesus. And so when you hear, like in Luke 10, of the good Samaritan. Right. I mean, you don't really get how jarring that is for Jesus to speak that parable 
unless you know this history here in Ezra chapter four, that these Samaritans are nasty people. They're 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 not they're they're not our friends. They're they're enemies uh, from the get go, and uh, uh, and and so it really shows then how the magnitude of, of of Jesus's grace and love toward like the Samaritan woman, for example, and um, and we have a little bit of a taste of this too in Luke's gospel. Ah, I keep forgetting where exactly in Luke's gospel where they get rejected in Samaria. And then the... the, oh, the that's the, a nine, I think, maybe? Yeah, after nine. Right the transfiguration, I think, right around, somewhere around there. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, the disciples want to throw, call fire down from heaven, and Jesus tells them no. Um, so anyway, so that, that ge it gives you just sort of the, the, the genesis of this great controversy between the people of God in Judah and the Samaritans. But it, it appears that that religious conflict evolved into a basic tribal conflict, right? Sure. Um, so when Jesus is called a Samaritan, it's not so much of a religious claim on him, but it's more of a racial slur. It's more of just an insult, right? Like you hang out with the sure. Samaritan. So anyway, but that's yeah. another that's another issue. Sure. Well, I mean, you see the, 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 the roots of both of those things in the book of Ezra in chapter 2, where you have that long list of the people who return, there is a mention there of genealogies and, and a, a particular group that couldn't prove their genealogy and so weren't yeah. allowed to be a part of the priesthood. So, you, I mean, you see how, and then you have this episode here in chapter four where the Samaritans uh, set themselves in opposition against the building of the temple. You see the roots of, of the way things are by the time you get to the New Testament. You can see where that comes from again, going all the way back to 2 Kings 17. So, all right, so we've got, got that in place. The people of the land, these adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, these are the Samaritans going all the way back to the days of the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom, Israel. They come to Zerubbabel, to Jeshua, to the people, uh, the remnant of Judah, and they say, hey, we want to build with you. We worship God as you do which seems like they're trying to be good neighbors. So apparently they weren't received as such here by the faithful remnant. We've got about four minutes or so before the break. Pastor Preuss, I imagine this part of the conversation will, will take a bit of time. So get us, in, get us started as to why their, what seems like perhaps to us, a friendly request or friendly offer is not received as such. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they just want to have uh, Eucharistic hospitality, right? As they as they call it, they want to have some some good table fellowship. Um, the, the the elephant in the room here is that the Samaritans are syncretists, um, and so God had commanded the people of Judah and Benjamin to rebuild the temple. That's that's the main point. But there's also in the background here they know that if they allow these syncretistic Sumerian, uh, Samaritans to help, then they're going to pollute the true worship of God. Um, so syncretism, let me define that real quick. Syncretism uh, is, is when you mix the worship of God with the worship of idols. That's just a very basic definition of it. Um, and, uh, and we... You know, syncretism is condemned all over in Scripture. What fellowship has light with darkness, as Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter six? Um, so, uh, so they they so they know that they that, that if they if they allow this, it's 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 going to pollute their work. Um, and it, it would be like asking uh, it would be like asking a Pentecostal to put together your help you put together your worship service, right? Of course, we would say that Pentecostals, as long as they're Trinitarian, not the Unitarian Pentecostals, um, right. ah, don't get me started on them, but the Trinitarian Pentecostals, they do worship the true God, right? But they mix into their worship, frankly, pagan influences, um, and, and namely the teaching that the Holy Spirit works through instruments other than the word and the sacraments. Uh, so, so you, when you have this kind of babbling of, 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 irre, of, of kind of irreverent tongues that aren't even tongues, that, that really is a, a pagan influence. It's not a Christian influence. It's not a biblical influence. Um, and so we would not want, it would not be a good idea 
It's not a good idea to get Pentecostals to help you with your worship services, nor is it a good idea to get Roman Catholics to teach you how to worship God. Now again, Roman Catholics worship the one true God. There are Roman Catholics as there are Pentecostals who are Christians, right? Who have faith, saving faith, but there is, they're, they're heterodox, right? They have false teaching that is, that is uh, mixed in there, like the praying of saints, uh, justification by works and faith kind of mixed together, which of course is not influenced by the scriptures. It's influenced by paganism and worldly beliefs. And so, you know, and we could, the list can go on and on that we're not just being sectarian when we say, no, we're not going to learn from this group over here that is off on works and faith or is off on the operation of the Holy Spirit and the word or is off on, you know, baptismal regeneration or whatever the issue is. We're not going to learn from them how to worship God. We're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to use what has been passed down by our fathers who held only to the scriptural teaching. And this example from these fathers in the faith is, it gives us a great, great guidance and, and, and a great way to respond uh, to these kinds of things that, uh, that we often have to encounter today, right? So, I mean, I think that their offense toward the, the, the people of, of Judah and Benjamin, uh, that they won't let them build with them, is very similar to the offense that someone like with you, uh, Pastor Apple, when he comes to take communion at your church, but he is worshiping at a church that teaches false doctrine, and you kindly explain to him, no, I cannot give you communion today, um, but let's talk about this. And often, unfortunately, you are not met with uh, smiles. And uh, well, you might be met with smiles, but then, you know, maybe you get a mean letter later on or something like that. You know, right. so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But the, the faithfulness of the remnant of Judah is an example that we would do well to take to heart. We're going to talk more about their example and their response on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. Talking to Pastor Andrew Price this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, May 23rd. We're studying Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 24 with Pastor Andrew Price. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. Pastor Price, prior to the break, we were talking about the way that the faithful remnant here in Ezra 4 avoids syncretism. They do not receive the offer of the people of the land, the Samaritans, to help in the building of the temple because they know that they do not worship the Lord alone. They worship idols as well, and so they say no this is not your house to build. And they, they do so in a way that, I mean, you know, you don't get the tone of voice in the text. But as you read what they say in verse 3, they just put it pretty straightforward. This is not yours. This is what we've been given to do according to the Word of God, and we're going to do it. And that's that. I mean, they just let the, the Word speak for itself and don't try to like argue for it or get I mean, you mentioned sometimes people get ugly with us when we hold fast to the truth. They don't get ugly in return. They, they simply hold fast to the word of truth. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and they give us a really good example in the way that they respond 
Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a way that we should respond to ungodly influences trying to kind of invite themselves into our worship. Uh, and, uh, and, and so what, what they do is they don't, get, they don't get into a big dispute about all the many false worship practices, which they could do that, right? Uh, instead, they simply rely on God's command and institution. Uh, they just return to that. God told us to build this, and so we're going to build it. And, uh, and, and, and so, so in a similar way, when we argue with those who have a false view of baptism or the Lord's Supper, we don't start by getting caught in the weeds about all of the little details. For example, like whether you should fully immerse in water or you should be baptized or uh, who should or should receive the Lord's Supper. Now, of course, these are issues that we need to address, right? The, the, these are important issues. But we should begin with the simple command and institution of our Lord. So we should first say, let's look at what the Lord himself says about baptism and the supper of his body and blood. And then we can go from there. So that, that, that gives us a good starting point. And this is something that Luther was very keen on uh, when he would argue on the Lord's Supper, for example. He'd just keep going right back to the words of institution. When we talk about baptism, you see this in the small catechism, you know, which are these words and promises of God, right? Uh, we go right back to uh, Matthew 28, uh, Mark 16. Uh, this is, we go to, the, go to the voice of Jesus. And, and then from there, we can talk about the different practices that, 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 that these words guide us toward. Uh, and we can say, you know, for example, like, why do we baptize babies? Well, Jesus said, baptize all nations. Let's start with that. And then perhaps we can go and see what Peter says, where he says, this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, and et cetera, et cetera. And we can, we can get there. But where, where we start makes all the difference. And they give us a great example on where, because these guys come in with, say, well, why can't we, you know, we worship the Lord too. You know, we, we, we've been doing this since this. It's interesting too how they say, we've been doing this since this king's reign. Um, it, can, it can kind of remind me of, well, I've been a member, I've been a Lutheran, for my whole life, and my grandpa was a Lutheran, and my dad was a Lutheran, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, none of that matters. Like, don't get caught in those bunny trails, right? <laughs> Let's go to what God actually said. What did God command us to do through his servant Cyrus? And start with that. So, uh, so yeah, and, 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 and as you said, they're not being nasty. You know, they're, 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 they're simply being objective. And when you are objective like that, it, it actually allows you to be more welcoming, right? So for example, if someone wants to take the Lord's Supper at Trinity here in New Haven, but this person has not been to church in a long time, is not living a Christian life, um, is uh, not attending, you know, maybe is attending a church that is teaching falsely, you know, my goal for that person is for him to be able to worship with me, right? And to be able to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, and, and, and so I'm not going to say, he might phrase it, and he might even think of it, or even phrase it in a way that I'm, I just want him out. I, he's not welcome, right? But for me, I'm just going to say, well, this is what God has called me to do. And... So part of my call then is to instruct and to teach. Right. And so do you want to be taught and instructed? Because that is the true worship of God uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And if they say no, well, then it's not, you know, that, that answers all your questions. You know, then the issue of whether you are welcoming or not is really not an issue anymore. Right? Because they just don't really want what God commands. And so, I mean, this is how Luther talks about it in his, uh, in the large catechism uh, and the, you know, small called articles and, and how our confessions talk is like, you know, after you're examined, like if people won't be examined, if people won't be taught, if they're not interested in being taught the word, if they're not interested in what God said, 
Well, then you have your answers right there. As Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my word. So the way they respond to them is by declaring, thus saith the Lord. This is what God said. And so let, yeah. that's a great place to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so unlike the woman at the well in John 4, who was a Samaritan, unlike her faith in response to the words of Jesus, or unlike the Samaritan leper whom Jesus healed in Luke 17, and he uh -huh. responded in faith, these Samaritans don't respond in faith. I mean, no. so, and you see that right away. Talk, talk to us about their response to, to this, again, just straightforward proclamation of what God's given the remnant to do. Yeah, well, you know, the word of God exposes the darkness, right? And so they show their true colors. Uh, they, they, they accuse the people of God of being rebellious against the king of Persia. You know, it's interesting, like, it reminds me of, like, 1 Corinthians 6, where it says, don't bring lawsuits against your brothers. You know, if what, I thought that they were your brothers. I thought that you were trying to make the case to them that you worship the same God. But now you're basically suing them. <laughs> like you're, you're, you're appealing to the, the, the heathen king to get them to stop doing the very thing that God commanded them to do. So it just shows their, their true colors right away. Now, today someone might accuse you of being unpatriotic or something, right? Because, um, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of times civil religion, civil, civil stuff is sort of mixed in with Christianity and religion there. And so you as a pastor who wants to be faithful, you might be invited to take part in some kind of ceremony. And then you take a look at it and see, ah, yeah, you know, that, that, that's kind of mixing in different, different truth claims and, and religious claims. And so I'm not going to do that. And so they'll say, well, you know, this is kind of colored with a sort of American sentiment. So you must be un-American or, or what happened. The Lutherans were accused of this and, especially in Wisconsin in, in, in the 19th century, they, they tried to basically close down there or force them to go into English, which was really just a, a cover of uh, forcing them to not be Lutheran um, and to be Methodist, basically, because um, that's what it means to be a good American. And so the Lutherans were like, no, we're, uh, we're going to keep teaching. Um, and if that's in German, so be it. Uh, but anyway, so but I remember, so another, this reminds me also of uh, the Masonic Lodge, right? Now, the Masonic Lodge doesn't have quite as a pull on our culture, um, at least not overtly uh, as it used to. Uh, but, but I had a parishioner in Iowa, up in Iowa where I served, the Masonic Lodge was, was, was very prevalent. Although they, I mean, I, you, you didn't hear a whole lot about it. I, mean, I lived right next to a Masonic Lodge. And I hardly saw anyone go in and out. Maybe they just like to keep it a secret, even though it's all on Google Books. But whatever. Um, so, but I, I had a. a, a don't you just love the internet? It's great. Right. <laughs> no more secrets, guys. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, so I had a parishioner who was like, who, who told me that her dad, like her parents, became Lutherans in like the fifties or something. She was she was a kid, or maybe the forties, and she told me that um, her dad would like. He couldn't quite make it up the ladder in the social and kind of economic uh, mm. you know, structure there in that town because he wasn't a Mason because he's a Lutheran. He was a confessional Lutheran. He took seriously what his pastor taught him about the Masonic Lodge, and he he wouldn't he wouldn't compromise. He wouldn't join. And so you know there are consequences uh, when you refuse to participate in unionistic or syncretistic practices. Uh, that are mixing the truth with error. And so we shouldn't be surprised if we have to suffer persecution. Uh, my, my predecessor in Iowa, so uh, Pastor uh, uh, Zimmer, faithful guy, really faithful guy, he took a stand um, in the community. And, it was, uh, and, it was, and I benefited from it because I didn't have to deal with the, the blowback that he had to deal with. But he took, a, he took a stand on something like this where it was he, they wanted our church to be involved in some kind of so, something that really was going to give a false confession. He said no. And he was, he was portrayed as mean and just like cruel and all this stuff. But he was standing on the truth. And, and, and the, these fathers here in Ezra 4 give us a wonderful example of courage to stand on the truth and don't worry about what the world and the devil say about you in return. 
Yeah. It, I mean, in that way, then, I, we just finished reading the book of Daniel here on Sharper Iron right before this. And it, it's, it seems that the faithful remnant here has learned what they should have learned from what happened in the book of Daniel. Would you, especially when you look yeah. at those first six chapters of the book, the, the faithful people of God stand firm in the face of much worse persecution than what they're facing here. I mean, Shadrach, yeah. Meshach, Abednego are about to be, or they are thrown into the fiery furnace. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. And they're, and, and I use the word success with a bit of air quotes, but their success is always found in their faithfulness. It's, it's yeah. never found in compromising the truth. And it, it seems that, that that lesson that the Lord taught his people in Babylon has been taken to heart, at least by these faithful Israelites who've come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, and, and the thing is, is that they don't stop harassing them, right? As you see, right. it says that, that, that it, it, it continues, the harassment and the attacks continue uh, uh, all the way uh, until, until uh, Darius, right? But then it, they, even after Darius, it continues for like a generation, you know, and it yeah. just doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't seem to, they don't seem to let up. And so, um, now I'll just, I'll, I'll just uh, say, you know, it, it, it says here that they bribed like the, the, the King's agents to prevent the building of the temple from Cyrus until Darius. So now this would have been a span of about, I believe about 10 years or so. Um, so is that, am I right there? Or... That, that seems about right. Yeah, we're, I mean, like you said, we're about 530 BC, it seems, in, in chapter 4 here. And it's not until closer to 520 when they're actually going to finish the temple. We're going to come to that in chapters 5 and 6. So yeah. verse, uh, let's see, verses 4 and 5, where it describes the ongoing frustration of their purposes from Cyrus till the reign of Darius takes us about 10 years farther. But then, as you said, we start to see here in chapter 4 the way this continued in the generations, because in chapter 6, we have the mention of the man by the name of Ahasuerus, the beginning of his reign. We hear about Artaxerxes in the letter before we come back to Darius, king of Persia, at the very end of the chapter. So help us to kind of sort out what's going on here in chapter 4, because if we're not careful, the timeline seems all confused. Yeah, now there are a few different explanations for this, but I'm just going to go with one. Um, that uh, so here in my in in my Bible, um, uh, the uh, the American translation. Now, does yours in verse eleven? Does that say Ahasuerus? Verse, verse, see, verse eleven. In in the ESV, it says to Artaxerxes the king. Artaxerxes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I just want to make sure. Okay, so. So, okay, so what you have is, um, okay, so the, like you said, the reader might get confused if he looks at the reigns and pays attention to the dates of the various kings. Okay, so Cyrus's reign, let me just break this down. So Cyrus's reign ended about 530 BC. Um, he would have given his decree for the remnant of Judah and Benjamin to return to Jerusalem and rebuild around that same time, so near the end of his reign. I believe it's actually 533 when he takes over, when he finally conquers Babylon. Um, and so it's around that time that he sends them back. Uh, Darius the Great's reign starts around 522 BC. And then Ezra 4 goes on to describe letters that they wrote to Xerxes and to Artaxerxes, right? Uh, so um, now one one quick thing about Darius, in case people are, are confused about this. So in in Daniel, Dar Dar uh, Darius or Darius uh, throws Daniel into the lion's den. Now, that's not the same as right. Darius the Great. The, uh, that that was some. There are some theories that that's just another name for Cyrus the Great. But I think right. probably more likely explanation is that Darius was uh, sort of a regent uh, king uh, in in Babylon, and Cyrus then was kind of doing his campaigns around. So that was a common thing for kings to do. Is to have kind of co-regents uh, for uh, who is like king in that place, right? Sort of like district is synod in this place, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so these letters then uh, would have been sent between five or four eighty-five BC to probably around four fifty BC. Um, it's around four forty-five. Uh, well, I'll get I'll get to that. Notice 
notice though in the letter that uh, uh, Rehum, uh, the Samaritan, that he sends to Artaxerxes, throughout the letter, there's no mention of the temple being built. Okay, and that's really important because they only mention the city and the city walls. So th this is because the temple was finished during the reign of Darius. So this is after, this is describing a letter just uh, that, that, that's written after Darius's reign. And, and this would have been under the leadership of Zerubbabel, who, by the way, is a descendant of David. And he's in the line of Christ, right, which is very important. And then Joshua, who is a high priest, whose name is the same as Jesus, right, which that's another issue which you can talk about when you, when you go through Zechariah um, and, and such, um, or just with other people here. Uh, uh, I suppose I could say a little bit about that, but I think we probably got to keep going. So anyway, so the, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, you know, are, are involved as well. So that's around 515 BC when the temple is, re, is finally finished and dedicated. So this letter then is simply given as an example, uh, as one of the many attempts to prevent the city of Jerusalem with its walls from being rebuilt. So this is, again, written probably around four, or yeah, around 450 BC. Um, Artaxerxes apparently caved, well, he did cave to these demands, uh, as we read here, and told them to sign. But we're told in Ezra chapter 7 and in Nehemiah chapter 2 that Artaxerxes sent Ezra and Nehemiah. And so this would have been around 445. And if you read Nehemiah chapter 2, you can see how Nehemiah is praying to the Lord and he asks the king to allow him to go back and rebuild. And, and he's praying to, and then it says he prays to the Lord and then the king allows him. So there's, you know, it's, it's the movement of, of, it's a prayer of a righteous man that turns the heart of this king to, to, re, to, 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 to go back on his decree to stop the building of, of the walls of the city. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when Nehemiah gets there, they show up and they're like, who are you to go against the king, right? And then they even bring up and they say, you're the one who wants to be king because your prophets have talked about how there's a king in Jerusalem. It's like, yeah, Zechariah did talk about that, but that's not Nehemiah. That's Christ. Um, but anyway, so they're, they're just, they continue to attack and attack and attack. Um, and so, uh, so apparently Artaxerxes changes his mind on that. So, so that, that's how we should really understand that letter. It's, it's, it's not... It, 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 it's, it's not a chronological kind of thing. It's, it's more of a report. It's sort of like a footnote. You know, it's like saying they continue to do this. And here's an example of a letter that they sent many years right. later. Right. Yeah. I think a, yeah, a footnote or maybe if you think about a parenthetical reference so that mm -hmm. if just to try to, to lay the chapter out, then verses one to five describe what's happening in the five thirties, five twenties BC leading up to the, the opposition of rebuilding the temple, the delay in rebuilding the temple, that picks up in verse 24. What you get in verses 6 through 23 is just sort of the, the footnote, yes. the parenthetical note of, oh, and this opposition that happened in the 530s and 520s, it happened in the reign of Osiris, it happened in the reign of Artaxerxes with this letter, and then by the time you get to, and that, that account then ends in 23, so that verse 24, there are some English translations that I think do a, maybe a better job than the ESV. The ESV says in verse 24, then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped. Something better, more like in this way, or thus the work on the house of God. Mm -hmm. So that verse 24 is picking up, like yeah. what you just read in that letter, that was the same thing going on, and it was in that way that in the 530s, 520s, the work of the house of God was stopped until the reign, the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So that verses 6 to 23 are kind of a, as you said, a footnote, a parenthetical reference of further examples of the sort of opposition that the Samaritans were bringing before the faithful remnant all along during this time period. Yeah, and in fact, in the, the American, in American translation, so the Beck translation, at verse 6, it puts a bracket and then the bracket ends, it closes at the end of verse 23. And yeah. so the reader can see that this is like, like you said, a parenthetical kind of uh, statement. And then, yeah, yeah. And then verse 24 is like, so anyway, back to the story, you know, back to right. 530 BC, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's helpful. So, 
Yeah, and so we can, I mean, again, we don't have to follow critical scholars who want to say Ezra got it wrong when he recorded it and wrote it down or something silly like that. We can simply believe what the scriptures teach us because they teach us the truth. So, uh, Pastor Preuss, with with all this, we have the opposition from the Samaritans that happens right around the building of the temple, that which continues into the days of Ezra and Nehemiah with the rebuilding of the walls, as evidenced by this letter that comes later. And then again, the, the opposition to the temple is going to continue until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, his second year. That's where chapter 5 is going to pick us up. We've got about four minutes here. Help us to, to take what happens in this chapter and, and apply it to us today. You, you had mentioned from the outset what we see in this chapter are the attacks of the world and the devil upon the faithful people of God. Uh, yeah. With those things in mind, help us to wrap this text up and, and why is this important for us as Christians still? Yeah, it's a wonderful historical example of the trials that the church goes through in her attempt to be faithful to God's, to God's word and God's worship, right? So we, as I mentioned, uh, you have the sinful flesh that attacks with like, oh, I don't know, you know, we, we, the sinful flesh attacks in all sorts of ways, but the discouragement that it's not like how it used to be and I wish that worship were more, you know, fulfilling for me and all that. That's just the old Adam. You know, that's, the, that's, that's your sinful nature. But there's also the devil in the world who oppose it at every side. And so a, wonder, a wonderful chapter to read in conjunction with the book of Ezra, and especially Ezra chapter 4, uh, is Zechariah chapter 3. And this is where Joshua, the high priest, who's mentioned here, uh, is, it, it, Zechariah sees a vision of Joshua, the high priest, standing before the throne of God, and the angel of the Lord standing by, and the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. Uh, and Satan is before the throne of God, and he is, uh, he is accusing He's accusing Joshua, right? And so this corresponds to the accusations of the devil, or of the world, who are really in cahoots with the devil. And so what happens then is that the Lord himself steps in, and Yahweh steps in, and he says, Yahweh rebuke you, O devil, or, or O Satan, right? And, and notice, he doesn't say, I rebuke you, but the Lord rebuke you or Yahweh rebuke you. So Yahweh says, Yahweh rebuke you. This is his obedience to the Father. So even though he himself is the Lord equal with God, he is obedient to the Lord who sent him. And Zechariah, man, I love Zechariah. He makes this so clear. Um, so the accusations of the devil are the true spiritual reality then that are hidden behind the accusations from the people of the land. And so to sum up, we, we should not be intimidated by these accusations, but we should always rely on the command and promise of our Lord. And uh, when we stand on that, then who is there to harm us? Who is there to accuse us? If we're standing on the truth, on what our Lord has commanded and promised. Pastor Andrew Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in New Haven, Missouri. He's been helping us today to study Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ezra chapter 4, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us tomorrow as we dig into Ezra chapter 5, as the Lord sends prophets Haggai and Zechariah to encourage the people to continue with the building of the temple. And we will see how the Lord provides for his people to continue the work that he has given them to do in his word. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. 
You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.